we're going to be taking questions from the chat. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we can start uh, by now. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to PAHO's weekly media briefing on COVID-19 pandemic in the Americas. I am Sebastián Oliel from the Communications Department at PAHO. Buenos días a todos y bienvenidos a esta sesión informativa semanal de la OPS sobre la pandemia de la COVID-19 en la región de las Américas. Soy Sebastián Oliel del Departamento de Comunicaciones de la OPS. Today, uh, we're doing this briefing for the first time through this platform, following physical distance recommendations. So we hope everything will, will, will work okay. Uh, you can also follow this briefing through our social media channels in Facebook and Twitter. Uh, hoy estamos realizando esta sesión 100% en forma virtual por primera vez, observando las medidas de distanciamiento físico recomendadas uh, y esperamos que, que todo funcione adecuadamente. Eh, esta sesión también la pueden seguir a través de la, nuestras redes sociales de la OPS en Facebook y en Twitter. PAHO Director, eh, Dr. Carissa Etienne, will brief you about the current situation on COVID-19 in the region. Eh, nuestra directora, la directora del OPS, la doctora Carissa Etienne, les informará sobre la situación actual de la pandemia de COVID-19 en la región. Uh, she's joined virtually here today by Dr. Jarvas Barbosa. He's our assistant director. Also, Dr. Ciro Ugarte, director of the emergency department at PAHO. Dr. Marcos Espinal, director of communicable diseases at PAHO. And Dr. Silvana Aldigieri, deputy director of the emergency department and incident manager uh, for COVID-19. Eh, la acompañan a la directora hoy aquí en esta sesión virtual, el subdirector de la OPS, el doctor Charvas Barbosa, el director del Departamento de Emergencias en Salud, Ciro Ugarte, el director del Departamento de Enfermedades Transmisibles, Marcos Espinal, y el director adjunto del Departamento de Emergencias y gerente de incidente para COVID-19, eh, el doctor Silvana Aldigieri. Eh, I would like to invite now Dr. Etienne. Dr. Etienne, le damos la palabra. Gracias. Thank you, Sebastian, and good morning. And let me begin by thanking all of you for joining us in this weekly briefing. As of April 6, there have been some 385,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the Americas, and 11,270 people have lost their lives. In just seven days, we witness cases and deaths more than doubling. The pandemic is accelerating rapidly and I urge governments to prepare and respond at the same speed. The number of new COVID-19 cases and fatalities is rising and we expect it to continue to rise in the region. As I mentioned last week, the situation is going to get worse before it gets better. And therefore all of us need to be prepared for more uh, difficult weeks ahead. As more and more people become sick, the brave men and women who care for them are put at greater risk. Of those affected by COVID-19, many are health workers. When a health worker gets sick, it takes a toll on them and their families. And it also impacts the ability of our health services to cope and respond under pressure. A pandemic like COVID-19 would overwhelm any health system, but its impact on those without sufficient health workers will be devastating. Today is World Health Day, a time to acknowledge and celebrate doctors, nurses, midwives, and many other people working to keep our communities healthy. I have been moved by the spontaneous demonstrations of support for health workers at the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think the world cheer them from their balconies and their windows. This is the kind of solidarity 
I'm always talking about. And we're going to need more of it in the days and weeks to come. Our health workers deserve our recognition, our praise and our gratitude. Above all, they deserve to be able to protect themselves while they do their jobs. Shortages of the most basic protective equipment leave doctors, nurses, and other frontline workers dangerously vulnerable as they care for COVID-19 patients. Limited supplies of gloves, medical masks, respirators, goggles, and guns can lead to a wave of preventable infections among health workers and threaten our ability to cope with the pandemic. Countries must work together to ensure that supply chains are able to deliver protective equipment to the hospitals and health centers, those who need it most. Solidarity and coordination among countries will be essential to ensure that we make the most of the limited supplies available. Now is not the time to hoard and stockpile. It is a time for easing export restrictions and embracing flexible regulations that enable access in the places that will be hardest hit in the next few weeks. <laughs> Governments and the private sector should also seek innovation, sol innovative solutions, sorry, to boost production and repurpose industrial capacity to expand supplies. As national governments revise guidelines on the use of face masks, one thing remains unchanged. It is essential that we reserve professional grade protective equipment and especially face masks for the health workers that need them most. We must also care for our health workers through support networks that allow them to preserve their mental and physical health. We must celebrate them for the heroes that they are and protect them from stigma. We should encourage and admire our healthcare workers, not fear and disrespect them. PAHO is committed to work with our member states to protect and support our region's health workers. For the past three months, our teams have engaged in advanced planning with health authorities to prepare for the challenges of caring for COVID-19 patients. We have developed technical guidelines and trained the national staff on the reorganization of health services, particularly for triage, isolation, and intensive care patients. PAHO has also advised countries regarding stock of medical supplies and personal protective equipment and has supported countries to obtain and ship PPS to 35 countries and one territory. And we've also supported in COVID test kits to 25 countries. As a health worker, it is my honor to lead an organization of health workers who have experience in supporting communities in every country of the Americas. It is as a health worker, therefore, that I'd like to share some thoughts addressed to my peers all over the region. My friends, the days ahead will be some of the hardest of our professional lives. We face a pandemic that is spreading faster than any of us could have imagined. And it is going to test our systems and our capacity more than they've ever been tested before. We are counting on you, on your ability to thrive under pressure, to respond to challenges and to fulfill your commitment to the people that we serve. We cannot overcome this pandemic without your courage and dedication. Please take care of yourselves, seek support, and speak up when you need help and resources. From PAHO, we will work tirelessly to give you the support you need in the time of crisis. God bless our healthcare workers. Thank you very much, Dr. Etienne. 
Uh, we will start uh, with the questions that were submitted via email now, and we will then move uh, on to the questions from the chat. So please do not hesitate to type them there either in English or in Spanish. And please uh, provide your name and media outlet. Also for people who ask us, we are going to uh, put uh, upload the speech of the director in our website, and we will also share uh, the recorded uh, of the of this video uh, conference. Uh, so um, also please please keep in mind that we will only be able to stay here until twelve forty five. Eh, so we will take as many questions as possible until around that time. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, doctor Etienne. Vamos a comenzar ahora con las preguntas que hemos recibido por correo electrónico primero y luego pasaremos a las que recibimos, nos, que nos estén mandando por, por el chat. Eh, así que no duden en escribirlas allí en español o en inglés y por favor eh, pueden identificarse con su nombre, el medio de comunicación y la pregunta. Eh, además, eh, tengan en cuenta que eh, podremos eh, responder hasta las 12.45 de Washington DC, eh, por lo que responderemos la mayor parte de las preguntas posibles hasta ese momento. So now, uh, for the first questions received by email, it's from Yvette eh, Munguía, from El Confidencial, eh, from Nicaragua. Uh, Yvette says, uh, Nicaragua has not applied any social distancing measures and authorities say that all cases are imported and there is no community transmission. Is Nicaragua's government following PAHO's recommendations to stop uh, the pandemic? What are PAHO's recommendations? Dr. Etienne. Thank you, thank you for this question. I, I want to mm -hmm. assure everyone that with regards to COVID-19, that PAHO has given the same guidelines to every member state, including Nicaragua. We've also given support to all member states, including Nicaragua, in terms of PPEs, laboratory diagnostic um, kits, and also um, technical support and guidelines. We continue to offer technical support and advice to the government uh, and the national authorities of, of Nicaragua. PAHO has been concerned about the response to COVID-19 as seen in Nicaragua. We have concerns for the lack of social distancing, the convening of mass gatherings. We have concerns about uh, the testing contact tracing about the reporting of cases. We also are concerned about what we see as inadequate infection prevention and control. At various times and at various levels of PAHO, both informally and formally, we have raised those concerns with the national authorities of Nicaragua. But let me say that Nicaragua is a sovereign country. Um, the government makes decisions for its peoples and decides what and how its response will be structured. I, I just want to say that PAHO remains ready to work with the authorities in Nicaragua to ensure that they are indeed uh, responding to COVID-19 in a manner that will save lives and avoid uh, too much uh, illness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Etienne. Uh, we're going to go now to another question from uh, Oscar Garcia, the periódico Prensa Libre de Guatemala. Oscar pregunta, eh, ¿por cuánto tiempo deberían durar las medidas de distanciamiento social y qué se debe hacer después de, quita de quitar la cuarentena? Doctor Barbosa. Gracias, eh, Sebastián. Gracias al periodista. Las recomendaciones que hacemos tienen que estar basadas en la evidencia científica disponible. No tenemos hasta el momento un número de países que ya estén adoptando medidas de la transición para la vida normal que pueda fornecer ese tipo de evidencia. Pero si vamos a recordar por qué es necesario eh, las medidas de distanciamiento social para evitar que la velocidad de la transmisión sea tan fuerte que los servicios de salud 
as unidades de terapia intensiva, os ventiladores, não vão estar disponíveis para as pessoas que se vão produzir morte. Assim que países, depois do período da de transmissão mais forte, que está aí ao redor de quatro, seis, oito semanas, dependendo de cada país, é, vão a decidir cambiar um pouco, adaptar novas estratégias, têm que mirar bem qual é a dinâmica da transmissão que está ocorrendo no país, Segundo, qual é a disponibilidade das camas de, de terapia intensiva de ventiladores? Porque se, se, se toma as medidas é muito temprano, pode ter uma nova, uma nova intensidade de transmissão e sobrepassar a capacidade de esse serviço. Graças. Graças, doutor Barbosa. Eh, siguiente pregunta vem de Ecuador, de Valeria Heredia, do diário El Comercio. Valeria pregunta, ¿cómo evalúan los sistemas de salud de la región, en especial el ecuatoriano, y cuáles son las principales falencias que han determinado? También dice, ¿sería necesario hacer un fondo común entre los países de la región para tener más equipos, insumos y dispositivos médicos y bajar sus costos? Doctor Ugarte. Sebastián, muchísimas gracias por la pregunta. Eh, los servicios de salud en la región de las Américas han ido fortaleciéndose progresivamente y se ha identificado, sin embargo, durante esta epidemia la necesidad de fortalecer el trabajo de prevención y control de infecciones, no solo garantizando la dotación de equipo de protección personal, sino también intensificando el entrenamiento en el uso racional de los equipos de protección. Otro aspecto que se ha identificado en la región es la necesidad de fortalecer el involucramiento del personal de salud, sobre todo de los primeros niveles. Luego de esto, es fundamental que los hospitales, sin excepción, estén trabajando en la previsión del escenario más complejo, expandiendo sus capacidades al máximo nivel e involucrando a otros actores de salud del sector público, privado y otras instituciones. El establecimiento de sitios alternativos eh, debería ser la última opción. Respecto a Ecuador, Ecuador está atravesando una situación extremadamente difícil y la heroicidad del personal de salud eligiendo salvar la vida de sus pacientes aún cuando no tiene todos los equipos de protección a la mano es digno de reconocer. Sin embargo, También hay que reconocer que hay esfuerzos mayores para que ese personal de salud tenga la protección adecuada. Estamos viendo que las circunstancias y la situación está mejorando. Aún así, vemos que los retos son importantes en toda la región y en Ecuador en particular hemos enviado una ayuda especial eh, adicional para que Guayaquil tenga mejores equipos de protección personal y también estamos apoyando en otros aspectos relacionados al fortalecimiento de la capacidad de los servicios de salud. Gracias. Gracias, doctor Ugarte. Vamos a pasar a la siguiente pregunta. So the next question uh, comes from Jacqueline Charles from the, the, the Miami Herald. Uh, she's asking, the FDA approved a new five minute test Given the challenges in the region with testing and what waiting days for a result could mean for spreading the infection, is there any effort by PAHO to purchase this, this test and distribute? She also asked, is there a ban on testing kits being sold out of the United States and how is it affecting countries' abilities to get access to test kits? We understand there is a global shortage of regions, uh, but we are also hearing from some countries in the region, they cannot get test kits out of the United States. Dr. Alighieri. Thank you, Sebastian, and uh, thank you for the journalist uh, for this question. Uh, the uh, ABOST test mentioned is not a rapid test, stricto sensu. This is a molecular test working very fast. At the moment, uh, this test is available in the US on the US market only. 
But in this context, PARO is supporting different pillars of the laboratory response in the Americas. The first pillar is to keep supporting more than 30 national laboratories and networks with kits to run their PCR machine. It means more molecular technique. We have provided during the first month uh, countries, these 30 laboratories with more than 200,000 tests. And we are in the process to ship more than 1.7 million tests at the moment. The second pillar is to work with the providers to access COVID-19 reagents for running their automated machines that are already doing TB, HIV, and other pathogens in their hospital and clinics. And finally, the third pillar of the PAO laboratory response is to work closely with national institutes of health and national regulation agencies regarding the field testing of a new non-molecular rapid test emerging every week on the market. Regarding um, some shortage and some difficulties in accessing um, some kits. Um, PAO is working with more than two months with providers in the US and in Germany that are not affected by new regulations. PAO, as I said, is providing national reference uh, laboratories with an increased number of tests from these providers. Please note that so far, PAO was able to train, equip laboratories in more than 30 countries in the Caribbean, in Central America, and in South America. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aldighieri. Uh, next, next question. Eh, comes from El Universal de México. Eh, y la pregunta es, eh, en medio de una emergencia como la COVID-19, eh, ¿está la OPS o MS preocupada por la, el número de trabajadores de la salud disponibles en México? Y si la OPS tiene estándares de la cantidad de médicos y enfermeras necesarias que tiene que tener un país, para responder a, a una pandemia. Doctor Barbosa. Gracias por la pregunta. Es seguro que esa pregunta está relacionada eh, con el informe mundial que la Organización Mundial de Salud lanzó hoy, hoy el Día Mundial de la Salud, y el tema del informe es la situación de la enfermería en el mundo. Y aprovecho para enviar un saludo y un fuerte abrazo para todos los profesionales que están ahí en la línea de frente. Mira, en todos los países seguro que el COVID-19 está a exigir de las autoridades nacionales que hagan esfuerzos adicionales para se preparar para un escenario donde la transmisión rápida puede sobrecargar los servicios de salud. En México, por ejemplo, el, eh, la Secretaría de Salud está en un proceso de reclutamiento de profesionales con la meta de tener 20 mil nuevos profesionales eh, participando de los sistemas de salud. Esto seguro que va a agregar más, más personal para responder. En otros países de la región hay iniciativas semejantes. Nuestra recomendación es que con base en los modelos que se puede tomar para la planificación, verificar si hay necesidad de una buena coordinación entre todos los sistemas de salud de un país, el público, el privado, el de seguro social, reclutar a nuevos profesionales para que los sistemas de salud tengan capacidad de atender a las personas. Gracias. Gracias, eh, doctor Barbosa. Eh, next questions come from Barbara Fraser eh, from The Lancet. Um, as COVID-19 cases uh, increase in part of the Amazon basin, what recommendations do you have for management of cases among indigenous people, especially those in remote communities, and for ensuring that groups living in voluntary isolation do not become infected? Uh, Dr. Dr. Aldighieri? 
Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you to the person from the Lancet. Uh, Bao is aware of the first reports of COVID-19 among uh, indigenous communities in the Amazon basin. Uh, the same concern applies to indigenous people of the Altiplano in South America and also other communities in Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, we have uh, developed and shared with uh, member states guidelines uh, regarding uh, this uh, recommendation for dealing with um, indigenous communities. The first important aspect of uh, the approach specific to indigenous uh, communities is a risk communication package adapted to specific uh, ethnic groups and their languages, taking into consideration their specific culture, what the disease represents, what the risk, the notion of risk represents. Regarding infection prevention and control in indigenous communities, I would say that the same guidelines that we use for long-term facilities involving senior citizens would apply in many aspects. It means reducing a lot visits, visitors from the exterior, from outside the community. And when these uh, visits are mandatory, use as a go-between healthcare workers, which are trained and equipped and medically check before they enter the communities. And also when contacts are really mandatory, really ensure that they are minimal and outsiders equipped with uh, the gears for uh, prevention and control. One important aspect in uh, for maintaining prevention activities in these communities is also ensuring that the food security aspect is covered by the local government. People, communities that want to remain um, autonomous should have access to supply chain in terms of food. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aldighieri. Uh, we just want to remind you that we are going to do this briefing until 11.45, so you can make questions through the chat uh, by now. Uh, les recordamos que vamos a hacer el briefing hasta las 11.45, unos 15 minutos más, así que pueden seguir enviando sus preguntas por el chat. Uh, and we have a, uh, from the chat we have a question uh, from Dylan Deschamps from Loop Caribbean News in Trinidad and Tobago and uh, very similar questions from Elga Velasco from Uni Unitel Bolivia regarding the use of masks. Elga says, eh, se ha recomendado en varios países donde el contagio ya es comunitario sostenido, el uso constante del barbijo a la población para disminuir la propagación del virus. ¿Qué recomienda la OPS en, en este momento de la pandemia acerca del, del uso del barbijo? Eh, y Dylan de Shonghi also um, is, says that governments across the Caribbean have asked citizens to use masks, particularly cloth masks. What is PAHO guidelines for, for masks? What type of masks should citizens use when venturing outdoors? Dr. Barbosa. Gracias por la pregunta. Esta es, es una pregunta que tiene hoy una recomendación de la OPS y de la OMS que es la misma. Primero que las máscaras cirúrgicas se debe preservar para los profesionales de salud. Eh, cuando, cuando se hace una recomendación para la población, es importante primero revisar si hay evidencias científicas que están a apoyar esta recomendación. Segundo, es importante verificar si esta recomendación es factible para la aplicación en la población. Entonces, ¿cuáles son hoy las recomendaciones para el uso de máscaras? 
as máscaras cirúrgicas e as máscaras especiais, que chamamos N95, isso se deve preservar para profissionais de saúde. É, as pessoas que estão com sintomas também devem utilizar mascarilhas, além de, outras, é, é, de outro, outros cuidados, como se isolar, é, estar com o monitoreio de sua saúde. As pessoas que estão apoiando a uma pessoa enferma também devem utilizar mascarilhas. Há muitos países que estão recomendando o uso de máscaras é, de fabricação caseira, com panhos, com telas. Todavia, não há uma evidência sobre se isto vai ter um, um rol importante em la transmissão do vírus. Quando isso se faz essa recomendação, há que ter o cuidado de dizer à pessoa que isso não é uma, uma bala mágica ou uma bala de plata. Que todos os outros cuidados de lavar bem as mãos, de não estar cerca a grupo de pessoas, de, de evitar contato, se é possível, de todas as, de proteger de maneira adequada a tosse e o estornudo, tudo isso segue o mesmo. É importante fazer essa recomendação para que as pessoas não creem que utilizando uma mascarilha de pano de fabricação caseira, aí estão já completamente protegidas e não necessitam tomar todas as outras medidas. Muito obrigado. Muito bem, obrigado, doutor Barbosa. E... Next, next question uh, from the Caribbean also, um, it has to do, is from Luke Caribbean News, but also Barbados today. They are uh, asking if Pajo can, can tell the figures for the Caribbean uh, and has there been uh, many cases of community spread in the Caribbean region? And also uh, Marlon Maiden from Barbados today, she's asking uh, about the situation in Barbados and what Pajo thinks about the measures being taken, uh, taken in the country at each stage. Dr. Ugarte or any of the okay. speakers? Thank you so much. Well, uh, first to clarify that there is no community transmission in the Caribbean, according to WHO standard. Still, there are some imported cases, in some cases or in some areas also, there are uh, local cases. I'm referring to uh, the Caribbean countries, uh, most of the Caribbean countries. We do have Dominican Republic, uh, Puerto Rico, and other areas where do, we do have community transmission. And uh, in that regard, we would like to highlight that in, in specifically in Barbados, Barbados have been establishing and strengthening their capacity to help other countries. Barbados has established the emergency medical team, and it is something that we'll look at to strengthen in terms of having that capacity also at the service of other countries in the Caribbean. And I think that is a, a good approach, but also it shows the solidarity that the Caribbean has always shown to the region. As a, as a matter of fact, the emergency regional team uh, that, was, that is well established in the Americas uh, with has most uh, participants from the member states were established first in the Caribbean. So we're looking for the Caribbean for this uh, epidemic, but also we have to highlight that those countries also face several challenges, particularly in the access to personal protective equipment on tests, and also, we would like to highlight that in this, in this uh, situation, we are following very closely at the highest level of, the, uh, uh, of those countries to help them uh, during this ep epidemic. Over. Thank you, Dr. Lugarte. Uh, one more question from the chat. Uh, it's more or less the same question we have from Narisa Fraser from the Trinidad and Tobago Newsday and also from Richard Kahn from The Guardian, from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, they, want, they want to know Pajo's recommendations for countries about uh, releasing names of the patient, like what, where does Pajo draw the line between a patient's right to confidentiality versus the public's right to know what's happening in this unprecedented time? Dr. Barbosa, Ugarte, who would like to take this one? Yes, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you for this question, uh, Richard. Every country has its own 
laws and regulations about that. But I do believe that is common, that the privacy is a right. So we cannot oppose the public health measures and the right of privacy. The countries need to report to their population the number of cases, the number of deaths in a very transparent way. This is the best way to build a very strong confidence among the population and also to show the population that the Ministry of Health are taking seriously, very seriously the, the pandemic COVID-19. But at the, same, at the same time, we need to avoid any kind of uh, threat that can be posed to a person that is identified in a community. This, uh, we had this kind of very sad uh, things when uh, HIV AIDS started in the 1980. So we cannot repeat that. The best way to protect our communities is to show solidarity, is to support each one, our family, our neighbors, our community, and for the governments to express transparency and to communicate in a very clear way to their population. Thank you. Thank so you. Can I add something to this, Sebastian. I, I think it is important to note that, um, particularly in the Caribbean, that there is aggressive contact tracing as well. So um, they may not tell you who the case is, but from that index case, we seek the names of all of the persons that they have known to have come into contact with over the last two weeks. And the country will uh, contact these individuals and give them um, instructions and, um, if possible, to offer them a test. So even if you're not told the name, the country is conducting contact tracing. Thank you, Dr. Etienne. Uh, we have another question from email uh, from uh, Sputnik. Uh, de la agencia Sputnik preguntan en Venezuela, uh, ¿qué gestión ha realizado OPS en Venezuela? OPS eh, ha hecho alguna entrega al país de test de pruebas o equipos y cuántos. Doctor Ugarte. Sí, muchas gracias. Eh, Venezuela ha recibido cooperación técnica no solo a raíz de COVID-19. Eh, es, tenemos una presencia muy grande allá en Venezuela. Como ustedes saben, eh, se pudo con, eh, contener El, el sarampión allá en Venezuela gracias al esfuerzo eh, de muchísimos actores. En el caso del COVID específicamente hay una cooperación técnica para la elaboración del Plan Nacional del COVID-19. Se han facilitado documentos técnicos de OPS como guías metodológicas, incluyendo la, la, la traducción al español de varias guías y ajustadas al país. También se ha hecho capacitación en el manejo de casos En el diagnóstico de COVID específicamente se envió un experto para poder hacer el entrenamiento de laboratorio para diagnóstico de COVID. Se entregaron eh, eh, test de laboratorio y también equipo de protección personal. Eh, se ha trabajado también en comunicación de riesgo y hay visitas de asesoría en muchos aspectos de la respuesta en, en Venezuela. Eh, podemos decir que hemos apoyado a 33 hospitales Se han distribuido 350 kits eh, de equipo de protección personal que incluyen para atención de cinco pacientes por 10 días cada uno. Se han eh, entregado 15.000 mascarillas, por ejemplo, batas y guantes de protección. Eh, se entregaron 500 kits originalmente para determinación de, 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 digamos de laboratorio, pero se entregaron eh, adicionales, otros envíos adicionales a Venezuela y se han entregado materiales también para viajeros. Hay un tema importante en el trabajo con Venezuela, es que es un trabajo eh, de largo alcance, hay prioridades en muchísimos aspectos y es necesario identificar, que, de, mencionar que este trabajo se hace con muchos actores, y este trabajo con muchos actores posibilita que se pueda dar una respuesta priorizada en aquellos lugares donde podemos hacer la diferencia. Gracias. Gracias, Dr. Ugarte. Uh, Dr. Barbosa, uh, we're going to ask you if you can answer in English uh, the questions for the journalists in the Caribbean about uh, the use of masks, particularly cloth mas masks and PAHO WHO guidelines about this. Okay, thank you. We had two questions from the, the same subject, one from a, a Spanish uh, newspaper and another from an English. 
So I, I said that IPAHU and WHO have the same guidance. At this moment, when we adopt a recommendation, we need to look for the science behind this recommendation and also the feasibility of this recommendation. So it is very important first to save the, the surgical masks and the respirators N95 to be used by health professionals. They are in the front line, they need to be protected. Second, in some countries, they are recommending the use of homemade uh, masks made with clothes. Uh, we don't have strong scientific evidence that this will play an important role to reduce the velocity of the transmission. Maybe in a couple of weeks, with many countries make this kind of recommendation, we will have studies, we will have research to, to show that this can play a role. But when the countries are making this recommendation, it's important also to tell the, the, the population that this is not a silver bullet that will protect them uh, to, to, to have the COVID-19 infection. They need to keep all the other measures, uh, washing their hands, protecting their cough and sneeze, avoiding close contact with other people. So first, surgical masks, the priority is to reserve them to health professionals. Homemade masks can play a role in certain settings such as slums, when you are in a public transportation, we don't have enough scientific evidence. But if you are adopting them, don't forget all the other measures that for them, we are 100% sure that they will help to protect you against COVID-19 transmission. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barbosa. We are getting to the end of this briefing. Ya estamos llegando al final de, de esta sesión. Uh, so we're going to make the last question. Vamos a hacer la última pregunta. The last questions come from BBC. Uh, the question is, following the evolution of the, of the pandemic in Asia and Europe, what would be the forecast for Latin America? How is the pandemic behaving in relation to these countries in the region? And when will the peak of infections occur, Dr. Etienne? So let me let me thank you for for this um, question. Um, forecasting is difficult. It's difficult in a situation that um, every country has this unique set of factors, and um, uh, our region has ma many factors that are different from the factors that are present um, in Asia and even in Europe. However, within the assessments that we've been able and analysis that we've been able to, to make, we do believe that in the next month or so, three to six weeks, that many of our countries will begin to see uh, an increase in their number of cases. Um, there are some of our countries that would probably ex experience an overwhelming of their health systems. And, um, we would probably also see increased number of deaths. Um, of course, uh, all of this depends on how well our member states execute the social distancing. If they are going to continue um, with social distancing um, uh, um, methodologies, whether we uh, we have sufficient workers, um, whether we have sufficient beds, particularly ICU beds, to manage critically ill patients, and whether we have something as basic as ventilators and PPEs. So um, the scenario tends to be different, and even within the Americas, the scenario can be different from country to country. Um, in our region, we do have weak health systems, some countries with weak health systems. We do have countries with fragmented and segmented healthcare workers, um, health systems, sorry. And it is how do we, in solidarity within countries and between countries, begin to share, to share resources, to share experiences, so that we as a region can come out of, uh, of this um, pandemic in as, as well a way that, that, that we can. So we are continuing to, to work with our member states, recognizing that we are about to face the thunder, so to speak, and ensuring that we can have access to the necessary resources that our member states need, um, strengthening um, what's happening 
at the country level. We have already gone with them through with them the assessment of what their needs will be, a rough assessment, making sure that those gaps are met and ensuring that the uh, resolve is high to face this, um, this pandemic. I, I Permit me to say that our heads of states are fully engaged in, in this response for the greater part. And um, uh, we, be, we continue to work with all of the government for um, this response. Thank you so much for all of those who've joined us and um, uh, we can continue to bear with us and that we continue to ensure the eye for equity and solidarity. So we thank you when you ask questions that impinge on equity and solidarity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Etienne. Uh, I'm afraid that our time is up. Uh, any further questions, please, uh, you can send them to mediateam.pajo.org and we will answer them as soon as possible. Eh, hemos llegado al fin de la sesión. Eh, cualquier otra pregunta pueden enviárnosla a mediateam.pajo.org y allí les contestaremos lo antes posible. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Muchas gracias a todos y saludos. Saludos.